Everyone, in this video, I want to talk about a separate backend application for your Next.js app. So this is maybe something that you've already wondered about. In fact, maybe you've already tried doing it. So in this video, we'll talk about why. Why even use a different backend app? When do you need one? And if you have a separate one, how do you properly integrate it? So actually, if you've ever built something more sophisticated, this is a problem that you've probably already wondered about. Because in a full stack Next.js application, it's all about a very fast request and response cycle. The client will make requests to the server side and we're basically trying to return something as quickly as possible. And maybe we're returning some UI or we're doing some data mutation. But what happens if you need to do something that takes a bit longer? So for example, I was building a video rendering startup and I had to render video. So I was making a request to an API endpoint to trigger video rendering. But turns out that can take 20 or 30 minutes for some long videos. Until that time, I could not just leave the user hanging here, the client hanging. Right. So there are tasks that you need to do that simply will take longer. Right? So ideally we can run those in the background. So we're not holding up the user here. And what if you want to prioritize some uh, background jobs, right? Maybe you have a paying user or a pro member and they you know, shouldn't get priority access, right? So you basically want to have like a queuing system with retries and other things that you typically want in a workflow. Now, sometimes we also want to run something on a schedule, right? Maybe once a week, you want to send an email to your newsletter subscribers, right? That's a task that I want to run in the background as well, but on a schedule, right? It does not really fit into this request response cycle. Now, sometimes when you do a long running task, like rendering a video, which may take 20 minutes, I would like to stream up updates to the client so the user can see what's going on. Now, traditionally, what you would do is do polling. So you would ask your server every 10 seconds, is it finished yet? No. 10 seconds later, is it finished yet? No. And maybe instead you were using server sent events, right? But still not great, right? So maybe you've tried using WebSockets or something like that, but yeah, also not something that fits in great here. So ideally we have an easier solution for those real-time streaming updates as well. Now, what if you want to use Python for a service? In Next.js, it's all about TypeScript. So if you have some work with uh, data processing or like AI, machine learning, or you have people on your team that are more familiar with Python, and right? that's not really what we can do in Next.js. So ideally we have a separate backend application that allows us to use other languages than just TypeScript or JavaScript. There is, you know, some basic observability around, for example, your API endpoints in Next.js. Right? You can see that they were invoked, for example, but, but it's not as granular as it can probably get. Right? So ideally we can find a separate backend application that can give us all of this. And there are other benefits of having a separate backend as well, which is that we can scale this up or down independently from the Next.js app. And if we're creating a separate backend here, we can also deploy it independently. We, we don't have to ask the Next.js team. We don't have to touch anything about the Next.js Next.js app itself, we can deploy this independently from the Next.js app. And if something does go wrong, maybe something goes wrong in the cron job, we ideally do not affect the Next.js app. We ideally just isolate it to, well, ideally just that cron job, but at least separate it from the Next.js app. Now the Next.js docs themselves concede that uh, you can use Next.js as what they call a back end for your front end right, the BFF pattern. You can imagine that the server side is sort of a thin layer servicing the client. But they do mention here, good to know, Next.js backend capabilities are not a full backend replacement, right? They serve as an API layer. In fact, you can actually use Next.js just for the API layer. So you can actually only have API endpoints if you want, but it's not a complete backend framework that offers all of these features. Now, what I could do is I could spin up a separate Node.js server, maybe Express, and that's actually what I tried doing for my video rendering startup. But even with Node.js and Express, this is still a lot of work. I was still gluing together a bunch of separate services. So that really wasn't the best experience either. Ideally, we do have a separate backend application that does have all of these features that we're looking for. Now I found it and it's called Mosha. They're sponsoring the channel and they're part of Versailles open source program. You can check them out on GitHub right here. Make sure to use the link in the description. Now you've probably seen that I've been using them in some other videos. I just generally had a great time integrating this in my web frameworks. It's not just Next.js. I have a separate video with 10 stack start as well in which it was also really easy to add pretty advanced features that would have taken so much more time in the past to set up, but are actually really easy to set up with Moshe. It's just a great developer experience right? because you get all of these things that we just discussed, you get all of that out of the box with Moshe. So you don't have to glue together a bunch of different uh, services. You just 
compose your backend application with what they call steps. So they have one primitive, it's called a step. So you can combine steps and create really sophisticated backend applications. Now this space right now is getting really popular because a lot of developers are running into these issues with uh, backend features. So if you want more context around the entire space, I actually highly recommend that you check out their manifesto. And they describe very well here how Motion makes it much easier than the fragmentation that you're used to, right? So if you want to set up background jobs with queues and workflows and cron jobs, and maybe you're building AI agents th these days, you're probably combining a bunch of disjointed tools together and the whole architecture becomes quite messy. Whereas if we can do something like this, this is still a relatively easy to follow architecture here. Now, most have skills to all sorts of complex workflows, including the AI agent type of workflows that you may be working on right now. In fact, they have an amazing demo here called Chess Arena, where the LLMs are playing chess against each other. So you can see which one is the best at chess. And this is all powered by Moshe on the back end. And you can check out the leaderboard here on chessarena.ai. And you can see here in the uh, workbench, as they call it, for observability, how that back end is structured here. So you can see we have a bunch of steps here, right? The primitive connected in certain ways. And so that's how you can build out that backend. And this is what it would look like in code. So you can imagine that you have your Next.js app right here in one folder, and then you have your Moshe application right here, right? So very clean separation here, but let me show you what the app itself looks like with some of those features that Moshe offers. I created a simple example here where I can translate text. So if I have a bunch of text here, I can pick my target language and I can go ahead and translate. So I can click on translate here and you can see we have different steps in this workflow. So now it's actually translating and you can see now it's streaming the results in. So actually there's two parts of the stream, the actual translated text, but also this status here. The point is I can hand off this task to Moshe as like a background job. I get all sorts of options to configure how that should run. And then I can stream back progress updates and the actual output as well, all cleanly separated from my actual web framework, right? So my web framework in this case is only going to receive an API call from the front end and it just kicks off that workflow in Moshe. Moshe deals with all the actual work so that with the Next.js app here, we can stay focused on just servicing the user's requests. Right, so let me try that again. Let's make it, I'm gonna click on translate. You can see we're already streaming a progress here. Now it's gonna translate the actual text, right? So we're able to create like really beautiful user experiences here without a lot of setup. Whereas a few years ago, this would require so much setup, but this is much easier now. And so here in my folder setup here, I have Next.js in one folder and Moshe, Moshe separate app. It's in a separate folder here as well. And I can just open up two terminals here and just run npm run dev on one side and then npm run dev for Moshe as well. Now I have both of them running. Right, so that's how I can start the app. Now, how did I wire this up in code here? If the user puts in some text here and then clicks on translate, we want to hand it off to Moshe, right? So how is that structured here? Well, in the markup, it's just a form. And the only thing that we do in a browser is just collect the form information and send it to the Next.js API endpoint first. We could also use a server action, but in this case, I used an API endpoint. And that's this one here, right? So here I will receive the form data. The only thing we want to do in the Next.js app is just be focused on the, the request and response cycle here. But the actual work, we're going to hand that off to Moshe as much as possible. Moshe, I can decide where it should run. In this case, it's localhost 3001. And I'm just making an API call to Moshe. That's right? so what I'm doing here is we have the form data. We send it over to our route handler. And so now from our Next.js server, we're going to hand it off to Moshe because with Moshe, we can do all of this. So we get all of these benefits and Moshe, if we want at some point can ping back into our app as well, right? So now the data will arrive in Moshe. How do we deal with that? Moshe is a separate application. So here you can see right, all familiar files. Now Moshe needs a way to receive that request and that data. Ideally, we can create an API endpoint here in Moshe. And we can do that with so-called steps. So in React, you have components right, as the primitive. Everything is a component. Here in Moshe, it's the step that is the primitive. If we want to have an API endpoint, I can do that right here. So I call this start translation API dot step dot ts. So there is a config object. So we describe what we want to do with this step. So a step can be an API endpoint as the type can also be an event, right? So we can create event an event driven workflow it can also be a cron job, for example, Right, so we just have to specify what we want. Right, so this is just some configuration for the tab, right? Also the path, right? So it's right, so I want to create one on slash translate. And then the actual meat of the logic here, 
is done with these handlers. Here we can run the actual logic that we want to do. So we actually get the incoming request and we also get the context object here. I'm immediately destructuring that here. So in there, we get access to a trace ID, basically an ID of the actual invocation here of the actual workflow invocation. We have a way to log here, for example. We can run the actual logic that we want to do in that API endpoint right here. In this case, we just basically want to kick off the workflow. We don't want to do that much. Maybe some setup here, like a, st a streaming setup, because we want to stream the result. So um, we'll talk about it in a second. We could return something like uh, status to code 200. And so steps in Moshe work with both TypeScript or plain JavaScript and also Python. Now, in this case, we want to translate the text. So this is like a workflow. So first, we want to detect which language the user has submitted. And right? that's one step. And then in the step after that, we want to do the actual translation. So with Moshe, we can create an event-driven workflow. So you emit an event with a topic and then other steps can hook into that. They subscribe to that. We can pass along some data, but in this case, it's the detect event, right? So now here in my folder of steps, I have another tab here for detecting the language. All of these steps are automatically discovered by Moshe, by the way. You don't need to do much setup. You can just write a file here, which right, I'm calling a detect language. And you can see we have another config here where, this, where we subscribe to that particular event that is being emitted here. So here we have another handler. And what do we want to do in here? We want to detect the language that the user has submitted. And for that, we're actually going to make a call to an AI model. Very common to have AI workflows these days. So in this case, I'm making an API call to OpenAI and I'm generating text here. Notice I'm using the AI SDK here. So this is not a replacement of the AI SDK, right? The AI SDK helps us interact with AI models, right? basically the actual data itself. Right? Moshe helps us with the flow of the data, you could say. Right? So we're just determining how it should run, configure how it right? configure how it should run. But I can still use the AI SDK to make the actual API call to, well, in this case, open AI to find out language the user is using. Once we have that, we can emit another event, in this case, the actual translation. Right? So I, I have another step for that, the translate step. Right? And it's all the same configuration, right? So these are event steps. And this one subscribes to that actual perform event. So again, I'm using the AI SDK. In this case, I'm streaming the text. So previously I was generating the text. This will give you the results basically in one in in one go. It's only two characters. I don't need that doesn't need to be streamed. I can wait a little bit longer to get the full result. Or let's say you have a cron job where you're not really streaming to the user. In that case, you typically want to go with generate text. But with stream text, very often we, we want to show incremental updates to the user. So you get the result from the LLM streamed in. So you can show a result faster. So that's what I'm doing here. I'll show you in a second how I get this in the UI. Right, so with those steps, I get this result. So I have a bunch of text here. If I click on translate, you can see it's first the text language, and now it's going to stream that result here into the UI. Look at how slick this is, and it doesn't require much setup at all. Now, how have they made that streaming work? I can set up a stream. I'm calling it .stream.ts, where I have some config again. And then in each of those steps, I can sort of write to that stream. So here, where we detect the language, I can set something on that particular stream. But this is on Moshe's side. This is basically right to the stream. But how do we consume that stream in our Next.js app? Do we have to do polling or something else? Do we have to set up WebSockets manually ourselves? The answer is no. It's super easy. They have created a React component. So here we have Moshe stream provider. And I just have to specify the WebSocket URL, right? which is just going to be the same like localhost 3001, but instead of HTTP, it's going to be WS. And then if I want to use it in a particular component, I can use use stream item. Right? So this is where I get all the data here into my actual Next.js app. But you can see they have these components and hooks out of the box with their packages here. I don't have to set up web sockets or polling or it all comes out of the box here with Moshe. All right, now what if I want to clean up that state, let's say once a day, or maybe you have some other task that you want to do once a day or once a week or on a schedule basically. So we want to have a cron job and it's just another step of type cron. And here I can specify once a day at three o'clock run this handler. So in the handler, I'm just clearing out the state again, right? So super easy way of adding cron jobs to your architecture. All right, so that's all in code. Can we also see some actual data around the actual invocations of all of this? And yes, they have a beautiful workbench here that you get out of the box running on that URL that you also use to connect from Next.js. So here I have a beautiful overview of my well workflow, right? So here I have my API endpoint, emits an event that is subscribed by this step. And then this step grabs to an event emitted by this one. If I want to see the actual code of any of these steps, I can just inspect that right here. Right, so here it's in TypeScript, but fine. 
Python works as well. And here I have that API endpoint that's also separately displayed here. So I can see information about it as well. I can actually also trigger it here from the dashboard. I can see my cron job here as well. And here I have the actual tracing information. So if I actually invoke that workflow, I can see the entire workflow here, including how long it took for each step individually, right? So this is the granularity that we want to see. You also get overview of your states and that state that we discussed, you can also see that here as well as logs, right? So you get access to a logger here in the context object. So that is integrated here with the Workbench UI as well. All right, one final thing I want to mention, what about authentication in an architecture like this? Because you can imagine that in our Next.js app, we may already have authentication set up. So we may already be creating JSON web tokens, let's say. How would that work with a separate application? Because remember, we have like an API endpoint in the Mosha app, which will trigger the workflow, right? But if we only want authenticated users to be able to uh, trigger that workflow, right? basically doing the translation, we need to protect that API endpoint. So these steps in Mosha also have the concept of middleware. I can specify multiple things here, for example, also error middleware or logging middleware. But in this case, I'm going to run auth middleware before the actual handler of the step is invoked. Right? And in there, I can read, for example, the authorization header, basically doing my authentication check in here. Now on a technical note, when you're already creating your uh, JSON web tokens here and you're sending them to the user, the user will store them in, in cookies. Then when they want to do a translation, the Next.js server side will, will either need to create a separate token for the Mosha app or you could also reuse the token. And so you have to grab the token from the request, also pass that along to Mosha here so that you can check for that here. In this case, you may actually wanna take a look at the audience claim that you can specify in a JSON web token so that when you create those tokens, you can specify that it's actually also valid or meant for the Mosha app. And the same is true if you wanna make API calls directly from the client to the Mosha app. This is typically not recommended, but let's say you do have like a heavy upload. You don't wanna go with the heavy upload first through your own server because it would be too much. You may want to consider uploading directly to the Mosha app and you probably also want to take a look at the audience claim in the token. In any case, hope this helps you out with adding a separate backend for your Next.js app or other frameworks that you may be using. I think there are a lot of benefits and with Mosha, it's never been easier. So I highly recommend you check them out with the link in the description. Make sure to start them on GitHub as well. And then I want to thank you for watching and I hope to see you in the next one. Bye.